now. Hi, I'm Sam James. And as Leo said, I'm the past president of the American Board of Group Psychology, ABGP, and ABGP's representative to the Board of Trustees. <clears throat> I want to welcome you to this presentation today about group psychology. And there's three things that I want to uh, be able to go over with you. One is that all, uh, all examinations, regardless of the specialty, focus on foundational and functional competencies. So I'll talk about that. The second is I'll discuss the application process to become a candidate and the steps leading to becoming board certified in group psychology. And then the last, last area is there are some slides which have way too much information on them. I'm not going to go into all of that information, but I'm going to show you where on the internet you can find that information uh, when you, uh, you want it. Let me start with the definition of group psychology. Group psych is the application and practice of group theory, research, and technique to the assessment and the intervention of problems and the enhancement of functioning to individuals, groups, organizations, or systems. Now, where this really has, makes, has some meaning to us is around can a group psychologist be efficient at assessing an intervention, both at the group level and at the individual level, and that they can distinguish between process and outcome. We are fairly agnostic about the types of groups that people are leading. Some people have dynamic groups, CBT groups, uh, they have groups that are designed for a specific population. Even some groups are outward bound types working with substance abuse uh, 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 patients. Whatever the type of group is, we, don't, we aren't really that interested in. What we're interested in is does it have a good theoretical and science foundation? And can the therapist articulate why that group is the way it is and then be able to demonstrate clinical uh, skills and abilities in terms of reaching their goals and objectives. The other part of the definition that we work with is ethics and legal foundations and that group psychologists exercise uh, APA ethical principles and legal standards. And the last one is really around professional identity. Is there a real sense of being a psychologist as well as a group psychologist? Now to be eligible, one must have a doctoral degree, PhD, EDD, PsyD and accredited either from the APA or the Canadian Psych Association, CPA, and an internship that's accredited by either APA or the CPA. Applicants who hold certificates of professional qualification in psychology, and I don't know what that is, from the Association of State and Provincial Boards can also apply, and one must be licensed in order to apply. So let's talk about the competency domains. They're the foundational, which you see on the left-hand side in the first column, the functional, three of them in the middle, and five in the far right column. Any competency that has one asterisk means that a candidate must be examined in that particular domain. Uh, and you'll notice in the far right side that those are functional, optional. And I'll describe each of these so that you have a good understanding of them. Relationship really means that there's, the, the therapist has a sense of, of the welfare, the rights, dignity of others, and can relate in a meaningful way with other people. The second one, an individual and cultural diversity, if you look underneath, you'll notice in purple, there is a question. The questions align with the, with the professional statement that this number two, individual and cultural diversity, also lines up with that particular question within the professional statement. Basically, individual and cultural diversity means that there are a variety of issues that are going on within groups, race, ethnicity, gender, age, religion, sexual orientation, et cetera, et cetera. And can the therapist be able to take all of these individual and cultural differences and be able to weave them together into a community that has therapeutic meaning and value? Ethical and legal standards I mentioned a moment ago really is much more about practicing within APA guidelines, but is aware of current ethical principles, practice standards, et cetera. And professionalism to expand on that definition, that there, the psychologist has a sense of, of values, attitudes, behaviors that represent the integrity of our field. Now, if we go to reflective practice, the self-assessment, self-care domain, this competency, the way we interpret it is that being a group therapist is a very complex task and it can be very draining at times. 
does the therapist have the wherewithal to be more mindful of how is this affecting me? How can I step back from all of this and be able to be aware of what's going on and make adjustments within myself? Do I stay up to date with the current literature and what's going on in the field? Number six, the sixth competency is interdisciplinary systems. As group psychologists, we intervene a great deal with, with case managers, with medical personnel, uh, with psychiatry, uh, even the courts. And can the, the group psychologists work in an interdisciplinary fashion with other professionals? Now I wanna take seven and eight and pull these together, science, knowledge, and methods and evidence-based practice. As I said earlier, we really look at groups resting on a strong uh, a clinical theoretical foundation. And so that, the, so that the candidate has expertise with the knowledge base of scientific and scholarly development and, and, and group psychology. And if we weave that into evidence-based practice, first off, there is not a lot of data on evidence-based practices. Uh, so it's pr primarily it's in the field of cognitive behavioral therapy, but can the therapist be able to integrate current research literature into that particular group and that particular uh, clinical practice? These are the foundational competencies. I'll say more about them in a minute, but just so that you have a working understanding, this is what uh, th th uh, these eight uh, domains and competencies uh, mean. Now, if we go to the functional competencies, the three that are required are assessment, diagnosis, and conceptualization. And that is that the candidate has the ability to both understand individual and group level assessments, diagnoses, being able to conceptualize what is going on, and then be able to distinguish between process and outcome. Process is what are your assumptions? What are you really seeking to achieve in this group? And outcomes, how well are you actively achieving it? Then if you take all this theoretical discussion that I have been presenting, can the therapist be able to intervene in a meaningful way that translates the theoretical underpinnings into effective clinical interventions and actions? And the last functional competency that is required is consultation. Uh, we have unique skills to be able to help in terms of systems understandings of what is going on. So can the group therapist or the group psychologist be able to consult in a meaningful way with other professionals when, when needed? Now, I mentioned that there are five other competencies that are optional, and they're optional because all, all group psychologists don't uh, practice within them. But if you have a research and evaluation background, supervision, teaching, management administration, advocacy, then there's an opportunity to add that to the practice sample, excuse me, to the professional statement to be able to strengthen your, um, your application. Furthermore, it allows the committee an examination committee to be able to, to discuss with you areas of expertise that you have uh, during the oral exam as well. Now, the application process is uh, pretty straightforward. First, there's a requirement of 400 total hours of experience of which 100 are supervised. Now, let me back up with that. It's much easier to achieve 400 total hours of experience than most people realize. If you aren't sure about the number of hours that you have, contact us. Uh, we will discuss this with you. The last thing we're going to do is to uh, help someone go for an oral exam who's not prepared. That's a setup. But many times people self-select out because they say, I don't meet the standards. I don't have this. I don't have that but when they are generally much closer to meeting these standards than they actually realize. These standards can need to be met in a minimum of two years of experience, one of which is pre-doctoral, uh, one year of group psychology postdoc, and 90 hours of didactic experience. We know that there are very few graduate programs or internships that have dedicated group programs. And most people who go into the group field have cobbled together through the American Group Psychotherapy Association or one of their affiliates like a Northeastern Society for Group Psychotherapy here in Boston. And in cobbling together these, they, they are able to pull together a fairly strong background and didactic understanding of groups. Those two count and we will that we can work with you. There needs to be two years of postdoc or of 98 hours of group experience that's not officially organized as a group postdoctoral program. And otherwise we wanna see what you look like on your own. 
the practice sample in the middle and the professional statement. When, the, when you submit your professional statement and practice sample, we also ask for CV and six encrypted thumb drives of one group session. That needs to be a, a minimum of 20 minutes or the senior option, which I will explain in a minute uh, in terms of submitting those information. The, the last panel there, I sort of grayed out. I'll come back to that in a minute when we have more information. I think you'll find it more helpful. Now, the professional statement and the practice sample. The professional statement I really want to dwell on. The professional statement is the way that the candidate says hello to the committee, examination committee. There are 10 different areas there and questions that we ask people to fill in. And you will notice that, that questions two through seven all have in bold, uh, type like number four, self-assessment, self-care. These are the questions that pertain to the competency domains that I just went through a, a few minutes ago. And this is important to be very clear about. If you're an early career psychologist, this is an opportunity to have a structured way to step back and think about yourself as a, as a psychologist. What kind of psychologist am I? Who am I? How do I practice? and to think through the foundational underpinnings of your, your practice uh, at this point in your career. It is enormously helpful to have a structured format. My bias is, and it's just my bias, is that the goal of ABAP is not to pass the exam. The goal of ABAP is to become a better group psychologist. Let me tell you what I mean. I was part of the original cohort of establishing the group psychology specialty in the 1990s. At that point, I was in the assistant uh, director of groups at Massachusetts General Hospital and teaching at Harvard Medical School. I went back and reread articles that had been meaningful to me over 25 years. I looked at the, uh, the assumptions that I was, looking, was working on and realized that many of those assumptions were outdated or they had, there was new information to be brought to bear. And in the process of getting ready for the oral exam, I became a better group therapist, a better instructor, and a better supervisor. That's what I think this whole part of ABEP is about, is making us better in the specialty in which we choose. And the professional statement is a great way to put your best foot forward and to think through the type of group psychologist you are and how you practice. The practice sample is one of the areas that I said I'm not going to spend a lot of time on because as you can see there, there's a lot of name, rank, and serial number information. By the time you would get to this point, you'd be three or four months into the process. And we really strongly encourage that every candidate have a mentor. We have a pool of some excellent mentors because the mentor says you're, most people study way too much information. It's way too wide. And we help people study in a much more specific targeted way. And when you get ready to do the practice sample, a mentor can help you prepare for it. In a minute, I'll show you where you can be able to find this information uh, on your own through Google and uh, be able to have access to it if you would like to see more immediately. Now, specifically, the practice sample is six password protected, unedited videos that are on USB. And what we really want to do is to see a candidate's ability to diagnose, assess, and intervene in a, in a group. The group needs to be within the past two years. And we ask for a transcript of all transactions in the group. This is onerous, no question. But the reason we do is that some people speak with an accent or they mumble, or someone says something funny and all we hear is the laughter. And the transcript allows us to be able to follow uh, the, the full flow of the dialogue. I also like to just read the transcript when I'm an examiner and see what I, what I learn or what I hear just within the flow of the discussions as they are, are written down. Now, the senior psychologist option is for those who have been uh, practicing for 15 plus years. And the difference is, is that we believe that there is a portfolio of experiences that people have after 15 years of experience that they can draw upon. These could be publications, presentations, uh, it could be uh, uh, courses that are being taught, and these can be presented in lieu of video practice samples. You still have to submit a curriculum vitae and a professional statement, but this can be done instead of having a, a uh, uh, video. Uh, senior people can also still go uh, present a video and, and applying within 
the same uh, parameters that I've discussed earlier. But this is a way of being able to recognize people's senior experiences and being able to provide them with another avenue towards um, being AVEP certified. Now, I want to come back to once the application is submitted, the practice sample professional statement has been read and approved, what does the oral examination look like? It is very important to, to think about the practice sample and the professional statement as the first two thirds of the examination. So that a candidate who has presented materials uh, in both of those gets to frame what the committee is going to focus on for the first two hours. That's pretty much two thirds of the, of the whole time. And, the, and when that is done well, the oral exam really is much more like a peer review. It's very collegial and we try to make all the exams very collegial anyway, but it's especially collegial because we're all digging in and looking at and talking about the same, uh, same dynamics that the candidate is presenting. The, after that, there's a break. Then we will present a tape and ask the candidate to be the supervisor of the therapist on that tape and say, what do you see? What's going on? How could this, be, this group be better or different? Uh, and following that, we would provide an ethics vignette. It's all a very straightforward exam. There's no correct answers. There's no trick questions. It really is saying, what kind of work do you do? Present it to us. Uh, let us be able to discuss it with you. And then we will give you some additional work and tell us what you think about, about, uh, about this. The focus is on the core competencies. A candidate needs to be approved by two of the three examiners. And once they pass, they get 40 hours of CPE uh, credits. Now, some helpful hints. Don't pass up the chance to work with a mentor uh, because a mentor is going to be your guide in helping you be more targeted in the way that you prepare and in the work that you submit. Uh, in a minute, I'll show you where to find the exam manual. And that is what we work from, from a committee, uh, exam committee perspective. And we really ask that candidates be familiar with it so that they know what we're doing and they can join us in that uh, form of inquiry. For the professional statement, submit a document that's 12 double space pages or less. Please don't write a thesis of 25 or 30 pages. Uh, provide a timely video sample within the last two years. And in the questions that deal with an ethical dilemma, pay attention to the ethical dilemma. Sometimes people present naughty clinical problems, but they're not ethical problems. And so we have to ask them to resubmit. And ensure that your groups has a good theoretical scientific underpinning or evidence-based group practice. Now, I said I'd help you be able to find the data. It's very straightforward. If you go to Google, and you type in ABGP, this page will come up, American Board of Group Psychology. If you click on it, you will go into the ABEPS website, but within ABEPS website, we have a website, and this will be able to provide you with the documents and the information that you need. If you look down at the bottom here, it just says exam registration, payments, and process. So that will give you all the logistical information. Specialty specific requirements, uh, will help you go back. And in some of the things that I had not taken the time to dwell on, you can really dwell on those more here. And then the third one is the document library. And this is where if you click on it, you'll be able to find the exam manual, the application, and we ask for two letters of endorsement. And so the specific information that, that you're going to need to be able to apply and to prepare yourself will be there. So that has all uh, been set up so that it's very easy for, for interested people, applicants, candidates to be able to have access to the information. The last thing I wanna say is that we have a website, grouppsychologist.org. And if you uh, want more information, you can click on this link and be able to find that information. So that is, uh, that is the data. Thank you for joining us. If you have any questions, we'll be glad to discuss them further. So a question in the chat is, how would one secure an ABAP psychologist mentor? If you, you've got my email address on the screen, uh, sjames at srjames.com. 
if you will send me your request, then I will put you in touch with the uh, national uh, uh, exam coordinator. And she will be the one to help you get started with the process. I'm the one in charge of our mentors. And then once the application has been approved by ABEP and this specially specific application has been approved, then I would help you find a, a mentor uh, to help you get going. Does the certification have to be renewed every few years? That, that is the maintenance certification does need to be reviewed uh, by anyone coming in. And I don't remember how many years that is. It's a, basically, a, it's not another oral examination. Uh, it's a little bit more akin to CEUs and being able to demonstrate that you have stayed up to speed with your specialty and uh, that uh, you're in good standing. It, the reason I'm a little hesitant, it hasn't fully begun. Uh, and it's still in the process of being uh, set up and working out the kinks. But it, it is going to occur. It just hasn't occurred at this point in time. Sure, I think I can add some um, information there. Um, if I remember correctly, the maintenance certification will be every 10 years. Um, and I think it started in 2015 which would mean the first round of maintenance certification won't occur until 2025. 20, uh, so anyone that is board certified post to 2015. Um, so probably many specialty boards are still refining that process. Thanks, Leo. You're welcome. So thank you for joining us today. If you have any more uh, have requests for additional information, please send me an email and I'll be very glad to respond promptly. Thank you.